All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CS10 Lecture 15. Woo! I am so excited to have a wonderful guest speaker. Rafi Krikorian from Twitter has been so gracious in the past. Every semester he's come by and given us a little taste of what it's like. This is, like our, this is our only industry talk of the semester. So this is a chance for somebody who does computer science in the real world to come back and say, look, what you're learning in CSN is really real and really relevant. And if, it, if you get excited about this, which I, we, we both hope you do, there are opportunities at the end of the rainbow to maybe work with him. So that's some good <laughs> stuff out there, all right? So folks, let's give a hand for Rafi Krikorian for Twitter. Woo! Hey, so, so like, like Dan said, my name is Rafi Krikorian. I'm the director of a group that we call Application Services on Twitter. So for those who use Twitter, there's a couple of nouns and verbs that go along with Twitter. It's sort of users, tweets, it's timelines, it's tweeting, following, DMing, unfollowing, favoriting. So all that logic runs on the, on the infrastructure that my group manages and maintains for Twitter. So we run a couple thousand machines in our data center just to serve up that kind of traffic to the rest of the world. We're one of the largest websites right now. So we have one of the largest scalability problems in just how to manage all that data. Like there are a couple hundred thousand requests coming in every single second of every single day into our data center and hitting the computers that my team runs. So the, the main job of my group is to really try to enable this message for, for Twitter. So like we're really trying to instantly connect people everywhere to what's most meaningful to them. And that to us means a lot of different things at Twitter. And for the engineering team at Twitter, it means making sure that we're running a service that never goes down. Like we're a service that you should be able to think about at any time of day. If you see anything interesting in the world, if you have a question for the world, if you just want to know what's going on, you should be able to come to Twitter and sort of ask that question or see what's un like understand what goes on in your network. Like you should be able to be smarter at any instant of the day just by sort of taking out your phone and like reading your Twitter stream and just understanding the pulse of the world. So I have, I have a few examples of that, and one of them is an, is a sort of a disaster or catastrophe one. So this is a, the USGS uh, statement for what happened in one of the earthquakes in Japan of last year. So it's a fairly large earthquake. Um, it, it's one of those that made the news, or it's sort of a tidal wave that came from it. And the visualization that I have next sort of just explains what the Twitter network really looked like at the time of that earthquake. So you can see messages sort of emanating from Japan and talking to the rest of the world to say that an earthquake just happened, like there are buildings crumbling, there are people trapped, there are things going wrong in our country. And you can see those replies as the rest of the world is communicating back with their loved ones, trying to understand what's going on. And you can see the retweets and all this messages propagating throughout the world, like the world is resonating at that moment with these big events that are coming on. But it's not obviously just sort of the bad stuff. Like there's also the interesting stuff that happens. It's so like Burberry ran this great campaign during Fashion Week this year where as models walked down the runway, they were tweeting the designs that the models were wearing. So in the world that, in, in the world that was last year, no one saw these designs until they hit the shelves or saw them on TV. No one has access to see what, the, what the, the fashion show looks like at any given time. You pay a lot of money to get in. And Twitter is being used in a way to sort of democratize that information. So like, this is definitely like the fun, trivial aspects of Twitter. But you can see what's going on in the world. Twitter sort of extends your reach into the rest of the world and sort of pulls that information back to you. And what it means for me is things kind of like this. Uh, so like I know when to wake up on Saturday morning because the bakery across the street from me sort of tweets every single time scones come out of the oven. So I know like whether or not I need to wake up, like whether it's even worthwhile getting out of bed yet because I didn't see the tweet about the scones. So I'll just stay in bed for a few more minutes. So these are the kind of things that we mean. We, we really want to connect people around the world with the information that's the most useful to them at the exact moment that information is created. Um, 
so just like a brief history tour of Twitter, this is a picture of what the first Twitter website, like the sketch of what it was supposed to look like. In this world, we sort of conceive of Twitter as this website people go to, you post a message, you post a status, and you sort of tell a few people about it. So it's mostly say like, I'm going out for drinks, or I'm, I'm having a beer, or I think one of the famous ones is like, it's really hot, I'm painting my house. It's one of the first tweets that came through Twitter in this world. But like I was saying before, this is the service that we've evolved to, and this is a really hard problem, like being able to make sure that you run a service that never goes down and can scale at the rate at which people want to talk um, and, want to, and scale at the rate that events occur. So a lot of the things I'm going to show and talk about are like what happens not just on a regular day at Twitter, but what happens on sort of the crazier days at Twitter and the kind of challenges needed in order to pull something like that off. So it's 140 characters is how many, is what actually makes up a tweet. And that word character is actually really important. Um, so for me, it comes down to like, what is a tweet? So, and this is a sort of the generic scalability problem that I face all the time whenever I talk to people about how Twitter works. Like how hard can Twitter really be if we're only pumping 140 characters through it at any given time? But the fact that it's a character is really important for me on the engineering side, and it sort of illustrates the difference between characters and bytes in a lot of ways. So given one tweet, if we try to think of what the size of that tweet ends up being, um, we're saying 140 characters. On average, it really comes out to be something like 200 bytes that makes up a tweet. And that's really crucial on my world on the scalability side, right? There's, a, there's something like 60 more bytes that you would think I need to be able to store. And a lot of this is because of Unicode reasons. So a lot of, a lot of the world doesn't talk in the Latin character set, and a lot of the world uses what we call multi-byte sequences in order to make up the characters they talk about. So for us Latin language speakers, everything makes sense. There's one byte per character, like the letter A is a byte, the letter R is a byte. But when you see tweets that kind of look like this, um, this is the world where I sort of also have to live in. So like providing international support in some way for Twitter itself. And in, in this world, it's kind of uh, us Latin, uh, us English speakers, us Western speakers are really disadvantaged because you can say a lot more when you have a lot more characters you can use. Like when every single character can actually represent a word or a thought as opposed to us being able to write a paragraph, uh, sorry, a sentence, they can actually write paragraphs in this. But this is also the kind of world and engineering challenges that we have, is how to maintain a service that not just operates globally, but is accessible globally in some way. So just to talk about this tweet for half a second. Um, this is from a particular astronaut. He's actually tweeting from, uh, at the time this tweet was created, from the International Space Station. So we actually enable people to be tweeting not just from Earth, but from when you're in orbit of Earth, which is actually a pretty insane idea when you, when you really think about it. And the picture he's, he's referencing there is a picture he took of Tokyo Bay as the ISS was floating above it. So being able to communicate that back down to all your followers who might be looking up in the sky and seeing the, the ISS or the light in the sky fly by is just such a powerful and, and awesome thing that uh, we think we're trying to build. Um, so just to further sort of set the tone of what Twitter is, we have what we call a follower graph at Twitter. So uh, people, two people in the Twitter system uh, could be either followed by or following each other. So this goes in a bunch of different ways, right? So it means that it's an asymmetric graph. It's not symmetric in any way. So I could be following Dana Danger, and Dana Danger may or may not be following me. There, for, for most of us, there's a social contract involved. So Dana Danger works for me. She's a friend of mine. We go out drinks. So if she didn't follow me back, I'd probably give her hell with it, give her, give her hell at some later date. But there are many people in the world who don't follow me back, right? So I follow Lance Armstrong. Um, he doesn't follow me back. I follow the president. The president doesn't follow me back. And that sort of implies a whole bunch of different things. And for us, it implies on the CS end what we call the interest graph of Twitter in a bunch of different ways. So me following the president and the president not following me back sort of indicates that there isn't a social contract there. I don't know the president personally. Um, so, but it means that I'm interested in what he has to say because he's sort of following me back. At, uh, he's not following me back. Me following Lance Armstrong 
indicates that I'm interested in cycling in some way, but Lance Armstrong doesn't follow me back. So there, we can eliminate all those bidirectional uh, links on the graph and only really highlight the unidirectional ones. And we use this in a bunch of different ways. So I'll talk about fan out in a second, which is just the raw challenge of Twitter. But from the CS and the machine learning aspects of Twitter, we use this to help understand what you're interested in at any given time. If I know you're interested in bicycling, I could either recommend certain people for you to follow if you want more bicycling information that you could follow the US cycling team for the Tour de France this year. Or I could put better advertisements into your stream. If I know you really like cycling, then I can put cycling ads into your stream and know that you're going to resonate with those a bit better. So we try to use this graph and mine this graph in a lot of ways to try to really make good recommendations for people who are using the Twitter system and for people who are sort of just um, interested in what's going on in the world around them. But so let me talk about fan out for a second. So fan out is the raw idea that when a tweet is created, it needs to go to everyone who's following me. So in this case, all the people who have an arrow pointing at me, I'm using that to be indicating following, are going to have a tweet delivered to them within seconds of me creating them. Uh, so just what this sort of looks like. So if Dana Danger tweets, the tweet conceptually is going to hit the Twitter system. Twitter is going to figure out everyone who's following Dana Danger at that instant and then start sending it to all those people. So I'm one of them, and there are a few other people who are following, following them as well. Um, and this goes on every single time a tweet enters a system. And this is the core scaling challenge of Twitter itself, is how to do that kind of deliverability. Twitter, the way I like to explain it, we exert pressure on the internet. So a tweet comes in, and then we push it back out into the world again. So we push it to not just timelines that you can see on the website, but every single time a tweet comes in, emails are triggered, SMSs are triggered, iPhones ring, Blackberries ring. Like the world just starts ringing every single time a tweet comes in. For me, it's not that big, right? Like I'm not, I'm nobody, so like no one really follows me. But if, if Lady Gaga tweets, for example, 20 million things need to occur within a second because about 20 million people follow her. So we're ringing cell phones around the world. We're pushing to Apple. We're pushing to BlackBerry. And we're delivering emails. Like we're literally exerting this pressure onto the internet. So Twitter is this amplification mechanism in some way as you go through the system. So at a high level, this is kind of all Twitter is. <laughs> I want to dive a little more deeply into this because you're all probably going to ask me, like, like, this sounds really easy. Like, how hard can it be to really do something like that? There are something like 250 million tweets every single day that are pumped through the Twitter system. Um, that's a crap load of tweets. Like, the, the 2.5 million tweets an hour, I mean, that's pretty close, right? That puts us, well, I mean, close to some definition. It puts us somewhere around 60 million tweets a day. But we're pushing, right now, something like 250 million tweets every single hour, every single day, every single week. That's how many tweets flow through the system. And remember, that's only tweets coming in. We still need to replicate and fan those tweets out on the way out. So if you think, on average, let's say there, that there are 10 people who follow every single Twitter user, the number's higher, that means we're talking 2.5 billion deliveries a day that we're doing. Um, the number is significantly higher than 10 on average, but that sort of just gives you a way to think about it. There's this amplification effect that goes through as you pass through the Twitter infrastructure. So let's just break this number down a bit. So if we have 2.5 million tweets every single day, that comes to something like 3,000 tweets every single second of every single day. Um, but really crucially, that's at steady state. And what do I mean by steady state? So if we took 2.5 million tweets a day, we divided that by 24 to get number of tweets per hour, divided by 60 to get number of tweets per minute, divided by 60 again to get number of tweets a second, you get about the 3,000 tweets a second. And I mean steady state because that's just an average across the entire 24-hour period. But that's not how people work, right? So like people are awake at certain times of day and people are not awake at other times of day. So therefore, they don't actually end up tweeting like when they're asleep. So we can't average it out just like that. And that really affects how we think about planning the system. A good analogy for this is my heart beats about 85,000 times a day um, when I was more in shape. Uh, so 85,000 times a day comes to about 60 beats every single minute that I'm going to pull off. I really, really hope I don't beat 85,000 beats in a single second because that means I won't beat again for the rest of the day. Right? That would just be generally bad. So the same analogy sort of applies to Twitter. You just can't look at it over a 24-hour period. You really want to look at it on a much more fine-grained basis. So to illustrate that, 
Like you can think of that my heart rate, and we've seen this on TV, we've seen this in doctor's offices. My heart rate kind of looks something like that. So you see a sort of like the electrocardiogram of what my heart looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we think of the same thing for Twitter, its heart rate, its heartbeat over a daily basis ends up looking something more like this. And just to give you some perspective, that's 24 hours. So the, between those two dotted lines are a 24 hour period. And the average zone I was talking about, about 3,000 tweets every single second, is where that blue line is. So what's going on here, right? So we're looking at a more fine-grained basis, and this is what the engineers on my team do every single day. Like, in fact, if the curve doesn't look like this, either something broke in the system or something's going on in the world, then we need to maybe understand that also. But what's going on here is that first peak you see as you go, uh, as you sort of like zoom through, that first peak shows up somewhere around 10 a.m. Pacific time. Why 10 a.m. Pacific time? So 10 a.m. Pacific time is when all of us are, well, all of you guys are probably waking up, but I go to work. So like all the people are commuting into work on the West Coast, they're tweeting. They, they haven't gone to work yet, they haven't gotten busy, so they're tweeting. 10 a.m. on the West Coast also means around 1 p.m. on the East Coast. So they're out to lunch, so they're also tweeting. 1 p.m. on the East Coast puts it around the same time zone in Brazil. Brazil is a massive tweeting country right now, uh, so they're amplifying this. It also puts us around beer o'clock in London, so they're all drunk tweeting. Uh, <laughs> and then if you zoom around the world, Tokyo is going to bed, so they're all saying goodnight. So that first peak is sort of this, in, this really awesome confluence of time zones that occurs on, on the planet. So therefore, all these people in the world just show up on Twitter's doorstep and start using the system. You sort of see the system dip down again as the sun zooms over the Pacific, um, passes over Hawaii. Hawaii, as much as we love them, doesn't have that many people, so it just keeps on going. And then the next peak picks back up again as you start hitting Japan, China, uh, Hong Kong, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Indonesia. Indonesia is a really big tweeting country, and so is the Philippines. So that second peak you're seeing is as the sun goes over there. And then it dips back down again as you go over India, the Middle East, uh, most of this vast expanse of Russia, and it picks back up again as you go back into the Western Hemisphere, as you go back into Europe again. So this is the day-to-day -day view of what the Twitter system looks like. And this is how like, I plan my day when we run Twitter. Like, we know when the biggest peaks are gonna occur, we know when not to do anything to the system, because that'd be too dangerous. We know when the, what we call the trough occurs, because the sun is in the wrong place in the world that no one's tweeting, so we can actually do maintenance if we had to, and not worry about the system going down at that point, because uh, just comparatively, the number of people we would affect is smaller. Um, but, and I wish I had a graph of this, but this is a very different graph than when I first joined Twitter. When I first joined Twitter, that trough was significantly further to the floor. Those peaks were just not as high. So therefore, you can kind of do whatever you want. But in now, in this world, in like 2012, like we're running a service that the entire world desperately wants to use, so we can never touch this graph. In fact, that trough has been climbing in the past few months. So it's, at some point, there just won't be downtimes in Twitter. Like the rest of the world will just start using Twitter more and more, and the system just gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and there's nothing we can sort of do about it except sort of just live with it. In fact, the story that we like to tell is in around 2009, um, we were planning to take down the site for scheduled maintenance, and the State Department calls us. Um, because Iranian elections are occurring right then. And they're like, can you just please leave Twitter up for the Iranian elections because they want people to be able to tweet. Um, so we now have this on every single minute of every single day. There's always something going on in the world and there's just no opportunity for us ever to take the system down. And for systems engineers, that's really scary. Like you're actually trying to do, it's, look, we liken it to many things, but one of them is we liken it to trying to like swap the planes off a wing while in mid-flight. Uh, so like, like just think of just trying like how do you operate on a patient while they're still living and talking. So these are the kind of challenges that engineers at Twitter face. So it's not just being able to meet this scale, but meeting the fact that we can just never turn it off in order to fix it. Like we can't reboot the system, right? If like you guys, if your computer's having issues, you just sort of like unplug it and plug it back in again. I can't do that to Twitter. So I need to plan and design the system so that we can turn off parts of it, but not really affect what we call global availability. So this is normal, right? Like I was saying before, if, if, if this curve ever looked lower than this, something's broken. 
Like when I first joined Twitter, Michael Jackson died, and there was about 300 tweets a second that went through the system, and we're like, holy crap, 300 tweets a second, what would we ever do? Um, now 3,000 tweets a second is our steady state, and these peaks get significantly higher. Like the Super Bowl of this year, we're talking 10,000 tweets a second were coming through the system uh, during the game. Or during the halftime show, we were doing something like 5,000 tweets a second, and not just at a peak, at what we called it, we called it a sustained load. For about five minutes, uh, we were holding about 8,000 tweets a second being pumped through the system. And again, remember, this is just incoming. This is before we do fan out on the other side. So the stats around the Super Bowl is that we have three huge peaks, one of them around 12,000 tweets a second. And this is not even the biggest stuff we have to deal with. Um, there was a great example of, um, in December, there was a showing of the movie Castle in the Sky in Tokyo. Um, and the commentators were saying, when a particular character says a particular word, everyone tweet. Um, unfortunately for me, they did. And something like 25,000 tweets a second were being pushed through a system at that moment. Um, and that's just Japan doing something. Imagine if the world is actually resonating and doing something big. So there's a few times a year that we sort of plan for these big events. So we, I plan for the Super Bowl. Like we know when the Super Bowl is going to be every single year. I plan for New Year's. New Year's is, it comes on a very particular time schedule. And the rest of these are kind of unknown events that we just have to deal with. But just sort of take a look at what Super Bowl looks like. So this is the curve of the heart rate, heartbeat of Twitter, or whatever you want to call it. And then Super Bowl ends up looking something like that. <laughs> So that's a fundamentally big scaling challenge for us. And it implies a whole bunch of different things. Like those three big peaks at the end, that top one is 12,000 peaks, 12,000 tweets a second. And we need to plan to be able to survive something like that. Um, like this is just a regular event that we know is gonna occur sometime in January, February, and we plan for that event. Um, it means that we throw machines at this problem. You can think of it in some way that if our, if our steady state peaks are a certain level and we're bumping up to this much, we need that many more machines to just sort of be sitting on standby, waiting for that day that traffic was going to show up to them all of a sudden. So our machines are not utilized fully at any given time. Like we hold a certain CPU level, so they're just not busy, right? Like they're hanging out, they're doing their thing, they, they take traffic, but then all of a sudden these big events come by and all the CPU, all the memory usage, and honestly the temperature all rises all of a sudden. The way I found out about the Japanese earthquake was I was just sitting around my house, I had, the, I had a graph of the data center open um, because that's what I do at night. And then um, I was looking at the Japan cluster all of a sudden, I'm like, why? Why is that redlining? And I call the data center. I'm like, like is something going wrong? And they're like, turn on the news. So like, you can actually see the world being replicated in the Twitter system in a lot of different ways. So like I was saying, um, there are a few times a year that we plan for, Super Bowl being one of them. I mean, Olympics are coming up this year. We're going to be planning for that. Um, but New Year's is another one of those events. So I'm sorry this one's a bit dim, but it's a visualization of what New Year's Eve to New Year's Day looks like. The size of the circle is the, the number of tweets that are originating from that city during midnight. So you can just see this ripple effect that goes through. So I showed you that curve before. It's that double hump curve that happens every day. New Year's is that one time of year that Twitter does something different. So every hour on the hour, you have this peak that ripples through Twitter as everyone says Happy New Year to each other in their local time zone. So then you see small half hour time zones show up as well. Um, and what it means on the planning side is if, God forbid, something goes wrong on Tokyo New Year, I have 59 minutes until the next one's going to hit. So we have 59 minutes to organize the team, get together, fix something that might be a problem because the next time zone is going to ring in the new year and then the next time zone, the next time zone. For the next 23 of them, we're going to have this hit coming through the system. And so this is how we operate Twitter itself. So for us, it's not just a technical challenge. Like we build this really large system. We've built, like again, one of the largest sites on the internet Internet. But a lot of what we do is not just a technical problem, but it's a people problem. Like, what, how do you learn from the mistakes of running a system like this? So we do post-mortems. We do analyses. We spend a long time talking. So on January 3rd this year, when we all came back, we got in the room, and we're like, OK, what went right? What went wrong this new year? And what can we learn from it? Like, let's write this down. Let's build some institutional knowledge. We're the only ones in the world that know how to run the system, so let's get it better the next time around. 
So we can build the best systems in the world, but inevitably something's going to go wrong. That one in a million failure that everyone sort of just ignores because like, you know, one in a million happens to me every single second. So every single second in a data center, I have a one in a million failure that occurs. Um, so planning for these worst case scenarios is what engineers at Twitter do all the time. So let me go back to the follower graph for a second. So this is one of the, the biggest data structures we have to maintain at Twitter. Of course, this is just a small snapshot of it. But every single user in Twitter, and we have over 100 million active users right now, has some connection to another user somewhere in the system. It's the follow-following relationship. Um, in fact, this graph changes a lot faster than tweets change. So people think of Twitter as sort of this read medium where you get your news from it. So like 10% of people create tweets for 90% of people to read. So that means that people who are reading are following and unfollowing people all the time. And it's happening at a rate significantly faster than just um, what TPS or tweets per second looks like. Uh, so Twitter itself uh, has a very interesting model when it's compared to other systems on the internet. So like the number of people you can send an email to is actually limited, right? You can't actually have an unlimited number of recipients to your email. You can cheat, you can have mailing lists, you can do all this other stuff, but literally the number of people you can address in your email is limited. The number of people you can friend on Facebook is limited. They've, they've upped that limit recently, but there is a limit. You just can't have more than N friends on Facebook at any given time. For Twitter, one million is, a, is an interesting guess. That means I can have one million people following my tweets at any given time. Lady Gaga has a lot more than that, so that can't be it. There is no p limit right now to the number of people you can follow or the number of people who will be following you on the Twitter system. And this has crazy side effects. <laughs> like The fact that like I showed you the graph of what TPS looks like. We have to plan for those huge spikes. We have to plan for celebrities. So celebrities coming to Twitter, they gain popularity. People talk about them all the time. Uh, Lady Gaga being the, one of the best examples of them. And they gain a... Re Oh, I'll, let me go back a second. They gain a <laughs> ridiculous number of followers on the system. So right now, Lady Gaga is pushing 21 million followers on Twitter itself. So again, like I was saying, every time she tweets, 20 million people get a delivery somehow of her, her, her messages or whatever you want to call them. For me, I sit sort of like a, in fact, I'm cheating. I think I only have like 15,000 followers. So I've rounded up to make it look a little more, <laughs> to make it look, look a little more impressive. But like these are the scales of numbers. I think these are currently our top three most followed people on the Twitter system. This also has, like I was saying, has crazy side effects. I have to plan for the fact that there isn't a limit. So that means we actively monitor the system at any given time. One of the graphs that we have is literally how many followers does Lady Gaga have right now? And do we have enough disk capacity for that? Um, <laughs> and, if, and if we don't, then we talk to the capacity team and we're like, eh, Lady Gaga's popular again. Can we have more hard drives? <laughs> Um, and this goes down and ripples down through the entire system. Like one could think that if we set the limit at 25 million, then we just make sure you have enough hard drives for 25 million and just leave it alone. But we actively watch the system and tend to it on any given day. So it's just like sort of like cleaning out the weeds, making sure you have enough space, making sure everyone's fed. That's kind of what engineers also have to do at Twitter. So again, not just building the biggest system, not just operating it and planning for these worst case events, but sort of just day to day maintenance and watching what's going on in the system and planning for that. Like if all of a sudden someone gets really popular, then we have to make sure that we have enough disk for that. Do we have enough ability to serve that traffic if, someone, if one of them tweets? And what I mean by that is Twitter has this interesting rule that if two people talk to each other on Twitter, we only send the tweets to the people who are following both of them. So it's the Venn diagram, it's the intersection of the followers of Lady Gaga and the followers of Justin Bieber. So like if they were talking to each other, Granted, they're probably the same people, but if you're talking to each other, only the people who follow both of them will get those tweets. So that means, again, in real time, we have to do this massive set computation. So in, like Lady, ba Lady Gaga tweets and talks to Justin Bieber. We pull 20 million followers out. We pull 18 million followers out. We figure out what's the overlap of all those and then only send to those people and do it within a couple of seconds. Um, and we can't cache that data. I can't store that somewhere and say, okay, the next time these two people talk, look at that, because the follower graph is constantly changing. The people who are following Lady Gaga and unfollowing Lady Gaga, the people who are following Justin Bieber and unfollowing Justin Bieber changes every single second of the day. So you're continuously doing this lookup. In fact, if I looked over the, over the data center, 
and if two celebrities are talking to each other, I could see the CPU on the social graph just spiking. Because I'll be like, oh, someone, two celebrity, two football players are talking to each other. Uh, do we have enough capacity for that? Like, what, how do we plan for that in the future better? Um, but so it means if we look, if we sort of zoom out, I'm planning for a world that we have 10,000 more followers, 10,000 times more followers than a regular person like me has. Um, so I'm really, what I'm really doing is scaling for what we call 10 to 7, and eventually we're scaling for 10 to the 8. Like that's our real scalability challenge that we look at, is managing a graph that changes at high speed that has no uh, practical limit on the number of followers people have. So the, the, the scaling number could stop at basically the number of people on the planet. So I want to be able to make sure if everyone wants, if every person on the planet wanted to follow Lady Gaga or Justin Bieber, like that's kind of the, the problem that sort of faces me and my team and the engineering team at Twitter in general. So what I want to do is just sort of talk through a high level view of what the Twitter architecture actually looks like. And a lot of this, I'll just go pretty fast, but sort of just to illustrate the complexity of the system. Like everyone thinks is a pretty easy thing to do. But when a single tweet comes through, it actually ends up rippling through about 10 to 15 different systems in a couple of seconds. So like the first thing is we hit a system that we call Snowflake. So for those of you who've ever created a database-driven application, um, every single row in the database has an ID. Um, my, we used to use something called MySQL. MySQL has something called auto-generating IDs. It basically means every time I write something to MySQL, it gives it the number. So the first time I write to it, it gives it the one. The second time I write to it, it gives it a two. And keep on going up. And we used to do that with tweets. When I first joined, we used to just write tweets into MySQL. MySQL is this open source database. Um, that fell over really fast. In fact, we're one of the first people uh, besides Facebook that ran into this problem. So we used Snowflake to generate new IDs for us. And we can generate IDs on the order of about 30,000 IDs a second right now. And we do it in what we call a distributed, uncoordinated way. So we never have to worry about different computers talking to each other. Like if one of the data centers went offline, the other data center could keep on doing its thing or another data center could keep on doing its thing. They don't need to talk to each other to make sure this works. The second thing we do is we hit a system we call RockDove. So RockDove is, it knows everything about the world effectively. Every single IP address that comes in, it knows what country and what city it's from. If you tweet it with a latitude and longitude, it knows exactly where that is. If you tweet it with a Foursquare link, it would know where that is. So RockDove just helps us figure out the context of what's going on in the world. So that way I know it's Japan that's having a problem right now, or it's Russia that's having a problem right now. We can pinpoint this really easily. And then we could build really cool products around it. I can build products that are only meant for European markets or products that are only meant for Florida. Like I can do whatever I want because I have the context that comes in the world. In fact, we did this X factor voting integration. And so the entire world can use Twitter, but we only wanted to count the votes that came from the US. So RockDove helped us do that because RockDove just knows that this vote was created in New York, we can count it. This vote was created in Australia, just throw that out. So we can do that type of stuff. We run the third largest URL shortener right now in the world. So every URL that goes through Twitter is shortened to t.co. Uh, we do that to just make your life easier and give you more characters, like Twitter is only 140 characters. Um, so Talon is spoken to to get these shortened URLs generated for us. So I, one thing I want to mention is all this is happening in a couple of milliseconds after each other. Like we generate IDs in about four milliseconds. We talk to RockDub, we do that in about five milliseconds. Talon can do its thing in about three milliseconds. So we're just rippling through the data center every single time a tweet comes in and talking to all these machines across the, across the cluster and asking them for data and saying like, you have three milliseconds to give me a response back because I'm going to move on to the next service. We have a system we call Thunderbird, where we actually end up storing all the tweets. We call it T-Bird for short. Uh, so Thunderbird actually can take a tweet, figure out where to put it in the data center, and where to put it in the world. So every single time a tweet comes into Twitter, we actually not only put it in multiple machines in the data center, because like I was saying, we have these one in a million error cases that always happen every single second. One of them could literally be a hard drive just failed on us. Hard drives fail all the, like your hard drive in your laptop probably hasn't failed in three years. Um, but if I have 10,000 machines, probably one of them is gonna fail today and one's gonna fail tomorrow, and one's gonna fail the next day. So I can't take the risk of storing a tweet only on one hard drive because it might break tomorrow. So T-Bird replicates tweets all through the data center so we can make sure that those guys are safe in case one machine goes down. 
T-Bird also replicates tweets into other locations around the world. So in case Godzilla walks through my data center, I can recreate all of Twitter pretty fast because we have off-site backups that T-Bird is managing for me. And again, this, it does this in about 10 milliseconds. So like the full round trip through the system to create a tweet and return it back to the user is on the order of 100 milliseconds right now. So human reaction time is 100 milliseconds. So in 0.1 seconds, I've hit something on the order of 50 machines, 10 different services throughout the data center, telling them to do things, getting results back, collating them together, and returning them to the user. And we're doing this 3,000 times a second on a regular day. And this is just ingesting a tweet. So just to go on the other side, so this is what maybe what a representation of a tweet looks like. We need to then syndicate this tweet out to the world. And like that's the fan out step I was talking about. Um, the first thing we do is we send it to a system we call Hosebird. So Hosebird lets people like Yahoo, people like Microsoft, people like Yahoo Japan, people like Yandex, to get a real-time feed of what's going on at Twitter. So they hold a connection open to my data center, and about a 0.1 seconds after every single tweet is created, that tweet is blasted all over the world to whoever's interested right now. So that's our real-time feed. We call it the fire hose. It's literally the fire hose of what's going on in the world right now. So you can think of many people mining that information to figure out, like, who's voting for who in the elections. Like we worked with the Nevada Voting Commission to syndicate all the live polling results for the GOP primary over there. So with what the second that voting station closed, the entire voting station closed, we would tweet to the world what the results were there right then, right, right now, right then. So the entire world can see how the elections are progressing. Um, another thing that we do is we hit the search engine. So we're the fastest real-time indexer right now in the world. So within 10 seconds of a tweet being created, you can search for it within Twitter. So I can say uh, uh, you know, the Emmys or the Oscars, and I can find tweets that were created only 10 seconds ago and, pup and publicize them back to users. So we can create really cool experiences around, uh, around big events that are going on in the world. That was weird. Sorry about that. Um, and then we have this fan out problem I was, I was talking about earlier. So every single time a tweet comes in, we hit a system we call Flock. Flock stores that social graph. We're one of the only people in the world besides, say, Facebook right now that maintains a social graph at the scale we do. Like we have about over 100 million active people that are modifying this graph at any given time. And we can access it really fast and get that data. So every single time Dana Danger tweets, I can pull out all her followers in less than a second so we can act on it and start fanning them out through the system. So at a really high level view, this is kind of what Twitter ends up looking like. It's, we separate out into two things. We have what's called the synchronous path, which is a tweet comes in and we return it, and then we have the asynchronous path. And my team needs to manage both of these, and we provide this as a service to the rest of Twitter. We provide this away so people who want to do machine learning stuff can, can read the tweets in real time and mine data out of them. People who are doing like media integrations can actually put the right tweets on the TV screen at the right second they're created. So like NBC's The Voice has tweets just showing up as commentary during the show, and that's because they're connected to the fire hose and get this real-time content through the system. So we can do these type of things because we're maintaining and running the world's largest real-time system right now. The only systems that rival us in real time are trading systems like the NASDAQ or the mercantile exchanges. Those are only ones, like those guys have obviously second, like one second trading windows, if not smaller. So we're rivaling them on size and on speed at any given time, at any given day. So the one thing I just want to leave you all with is this phrase, is sort of what happens on the world also happens on Twitter. And that's kind of all the stories I've been telling. right? It's, it's whenever the baker tweets that the scones are out of the oven, it's reflected on Twitter. When Burberry decides to have a fashion show on Twitter, everyone in the world can follow it. Um, when an earthquake happens, it sort of resonates on Twitter. Like the, the, the stat we like to say is like when the plane went down in the Hudson River, it, it, it took 40 minutes for most major news organizations to cover that, to cover that breaking event. But within seconds of it going down the Hudson River, there was a tweet from a person who was on a ferry that was going toward the boat to pick up the passengers. So like, we can actually really expose what's going on in the world. Um, and it's because 
we're trying to build one of the world's largest real-time systems, and that's really hard. And so if any of you are looking into those kind of challenges, then you should just come talk to me and we can talk about uh, what it means to run this type of system. So thank you.